Hello, I'm Dave. And today I want to ask a question, do we really need government? What was this system of government instituted for? I always rather naively thought it was something like this, to organise the people and keep the country running, um, to enact the will of the people, act in the best interests of the people and make the lives of the people better. But as it turns out, this is the definition from that uh, search engine AI summariser thing. The UK government, also known as the executive, is responsible for developing and implementing policy and drafting laws. It is responsible for deciding how the country is run and managing things day to day. The government sets taxes and chooses what to spend public money on and decides how best to deliver public services. While many government powers have been delegated to the devolved institutions in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, only the UK government can speak on behalf of the UK and represent us abroad. The UK government remains responsible for national policy on all matters that have not been devolved, including foreign affairs, defence, social security, macroeconomic management and trade. Did you hear anything to do with the people in that? So, let's have a look at this definition. Policy and laws. Well, that isn't true. The government doesn't make laws. It only makes policy, rules and regulations for its employees and corporations, institutions and agencies that it regulates. And you, only if you choose to agree to them. Just to be clear, government does not make law and you're not obliged to adhere to acts of parliament, statutes and legislation. It's all just government and corporate policy, like the rules and regulations in the Tesco's Employees Handbook. If you don't work for Tesco's, then you're under no obligation to follow their policies. And I think we've had more than enough policy in this country. So, deciding how the country is run and managing things day to day. Running and managing the country, what exactly does that mean? A group of privileged people making decisions about our lives without asking us and if we don't go along with whatever they say then they send in their private army to punish us. Well what does that sound like to you? Well it sounds to me like slavery or serfdom. And are they managing things day to day? What happens for the third of the year that they are off on recess? They get 101 days off which is not far off a third of a year. Does this country come to a grinding halt just because of the absence of a bunch of public schoolboys performing pantomime, jeering at each other and avoiding debates about things that actually matter and voting themselves pay rises? What if we put them on permanent recess, sack the government, not replace it? Would anything change? I don't think so. The government sets taxes and chooses what to spend public money on. The key word there is public, public money. It's not the government's money, they don't have any. It's our money. Shouldn't we be choosing what to spend public money on? Apparently not. Oh, but of course, they are representing us, aren't they? But wait, if that was the case, shouldn't they wait for us to ask for something that we collectively need before spending it, or at least ask us if it's a good idea to spend it? But they don't. The first we hear of it is after they've spent it. I don't know about you, but I only found out that myself and the rest of us have decided to give Zelensky and Ukraine three billion pounds a year, billion pounds a year for the next 10 years. I only found out when uh, it was announced on the news. Now, this is what a billion dollars looks like. But they have a hundred dollar note and we only have 50, so double this. Ask yourself, why are you doing that? Why are you giving a Jewish leader of a country that you've never been to £93 a year out of your own pocket for the next 10 years? Don't you think we could make better use of £30 billion to make the lives of the people in this country better? I wonder what Zelensky is using all that money he's collecting from all over the world for.
And what about the amount of money that has been wasted? 14 billion, at last count, on meaningless rubbish. And then there's the 5 billion wasted in government fraud under Johnson and 21 billion under Sunak, both reported by the Public Accounts Committee. And there's also the 500 million, that's half a billion, spent on Nightingale hospitals that were never utilised, but they're only built to heighten the fear of COVID. But of course, none of this money was actually wasted. You can bet that this money was laundered to the friends and family of these politicians, like the 18 billion spent on PPE and COVID measures that were awarded to friends and family. And I'm sure that this is just the tip of the iceberg. But the biggest indication that the government is working for entities other than the people of this country is the fact that we have a national debt of £2.9 trillion. But also that we have a national debt at all. Because what that means is the government is not content with just taxing us to the hilt, but they are borrowing money from international banks at crippling interest secured by our taxes and those of our children and grandchildren to service an unpayable debt. But here's the thing. Why are we borrowing money from international banks? The Bank of England has got nothing to do with England. It's a private company owned by those who own the international banks. It's a branch, just like the Federal Reserve in America. Why are we borrowing money? If we, as a country, can just issue our own money debt-free. We've done it before, and each time this country has become prosperous. That is, until the bankers worm their way back in. Bank loans aside, the government receives £786,590,000,000 in taxes. But where is all that money going? Are our lives improving? No. Not only are we taxed to the hilt, but we're also subject to a secret tax, inflation. My mum and dad bought a house in 1966 for £4,000, and it was sold 30 years later for £86,000. But who really won in that scenario? Over the 30 years, something like twenty to £30,000 was paid to the banks. Thousands of pounds were paid to the government in rates and council tax. And yeah, my my dad got some money in his pocket, but how much was that really? In 1971, we went decimal. Now, I have the distinct memory of trying to buy a chocolate bar, which was five new pence, and I had a sixpence, which was devalued to two and a half new p. But my eight-year-old brain couldn't understand why I couldn't buy it. After all, six is greater than five, right? That same chocolate bar today costs just over a pound, 20 times more than it did 53 years ago. Now that's a rough idea of the inflation over 50 years. So my dad borrowed 4,000 pounds in 1966, uh, paid the bank around 25,000, paid the government, let's say 5,000, And at the end, he got back 86,000, which adjusted for inflation was 300 pounds more than he borrowed 30 years earlier. And now they want to further hide the fraud by introducing CBDCs, programmable money, controlled centrally. 
analysis on CBDC in particular for the use of general to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash. Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who's using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, she, to what cash is. So folks, this is so huge, right? Um, they will have absolute control over every element of our lives, uh, not just our financial lives, if they get this passed, right? You won't take the vaccine, they'll shut off your uh, digital currencies. You won't uh, stop talking on social media, they'll shut off your digital currency. If they want you to spend more, they'll just be able to expire your money so that if you don't spend it in a certain time, it disappears. If they don't like what you say on Facebook, your money is going to be switched off. Same as if you try and spend your invisible money outside your 15-minute zone. Or they can decide if you've exceeded your meat allowance or any number of uh, scenarios. The government can lock you out of society or even life. And they can do it at will for whatever reason they make up. Who will really benefit from the implementation of these CBDCs? What we don't see is that the government are the banks. They are the corporations. And when you really dig down to it, it is just one big mega corporation. And we are the cattle fenced in by the banking arm of this corporation, controlled by the governmental and judicial arms, and culled by the food, pharmaceutical and military industrial arms. I think this whole thing needs to end. How long can we keep doing the same thing over and over? Electing puppets from the privileged class, first from the blue team, then from the red team, then the blue team again. How long before we realise there will never be a different outcome? My view is that government was supposed to, to be there to work for us, to make our lives better. But they've failed to do either. The government are clearly not working for us. They do not respond to our problems, wants or needs, but they absolutely do respond to the wants and needs of the banks, multinational corporations and the unelected international non-governmental organisations such as the UN, EU, WHO, WEF, IMF, BIS, etc, etc, etc. Why else would they be giving aid to Ukraine and Israel? I don't know about you, but I don't stand of Ukraine. A border dispute uh, occurring thousands of miles away is none of my business. I don't stand with Israel either. They're imposters pretending to be the Israelites of the Old Testament and they are unlawfully occupying that land, exterminating its inhabitants and pretending that they're the victims. But government have decided for me and you as far as the rest of the world is concerned, the people of the United Kingdom agree with Israel and hate the Palestinians. And we love Zelensky and his Nazi regime in Ukraine. We love it, love it so much that we're happily providing with money and weapons to keep feeding the people of the Ukraine into the Russian meat grinder. The rest of the world also believes that we hate the civilians in Yemen so much that we feel the need to rain cluster bombs down on them. Was that a school? Was that a hospital? Was that a Tesco's? Don't know. Don't care. We're too busy paying for it. And now they're preparing to embroil us in a conflict with Russia by hinting that they'll have to introduce conscription to fight it. What has Russia ever done to you? How have they attacked the people of Great Britain? We're not involved with Russia or Ukraine. Why would we intercede in a dispute where Russia is protecting Russian citizens on the wrong side of a fictional line on a map 
and who have been continually attacked by the country they're supposed to be a part of. Given that we know that all wars are instigated and funded on both sides by the same privileged class that brought us the COVID vaccine, the proposed world war is just a continuation of their depopulation agenda that can be plausibly denied as war casualties. So as leader, I would say to remember that legislation is not law. Acts of Parliament require your consent before they become law to you. If they come to conscript you, say no. You won't be fighting for freedom. How could you fight for freedom on a freezing battlefield in Russia when you don't have freedom at home? And this idea of fighting for king and country, well as it stands, this country isn't worth laying down your life for, or even losing a limb for, only to be cast aside and end up homeless on the street like many other veterans. And who wants to sacrifice their lives for King Sausage Fingers, or Klaus Schwab's other bum boys? Don't do it. If I were drafted, I'd be constrained to do what my hero and role model did. Muhammad Ali refused to draft. He gave up his heavyweight title and potentially the rest of his career and went to prison, saying, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger. My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother or some darker people or some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never called me nigger. They never lynched me. They never put no dogs on me. They never robbed me of my nationality rape and kill my mother and father. What am I going to shoot them for what? How can I go shoot them? Them little poor little black people, little babies and children and women. How can I shoot them poor people? I just take me to jail. Well, Putin didn't murder my best mate with a vaccine. Putin never murdered countless old people with midazolam. Putin isn't forcing us to pay council tax. It's not the Russian people trying to force me into a 15-minute city. I say no. I refuse to fight and die for you bastards. If you want a war, then you fucking go and fight it. Charlie Sausage Fingers, Sunak and Starmer can lead the charge. I don't stand with Ukraine. I do not stand with Israel. What goes on there is none of my business, though I'd be more likely to send troops to defend the people of Palestine if they wanted me to. But I would tell the people why I think it would be the right thing to do to protect the Palestinian people and then ask the whole country if they agree with me. And only if everybody did, we would go ahead. As leader, there would be no government, no taxes, and if we need to do something, then we'll get together and do it ourselves. It's not impossible, we're already doing it. Yes, we are doing it for money, but we can just as easily get together and do it for ourselves. I want to play the scene from the film Witness, which is a glimpse of the Amish community where the whole community gets together to build a barn for a, a young couple.
Today. Oh, we just got married. Yeah? That's great. The same barn could have been built with money, banks, mortgages, stress, sacrifice, employment, government and taxes, etc, etc. But it could just as easily have been built by people power. I don't know if it's just me, but I worked as a carpenter on a big project with a whole community of people. And I felt that joy of doing a hard day's work towards a, a worthy goal and ending the day tired but happy that I've done something worthwhile. I experienced the same joy when I was working with a community, clearing some ground and, and replanting it. There's something about working with the land. And none of us needed to be paid. Every one of us knew that if we needed something, then every one of the group would help out. That's how community works. I say we scrap the whole idea of government and try something different. I just found out that uh, in this country, 5,642 people committed suicide in 2022. That's 18 people a day. That's an indication of how inhumane this society is. Anyone who's found themselves in debt will attest that the moment you trip up or fall behind, instead of getting a helping hand, or at least breathing room, the vultures descend on you, adding more charges, making things more difficult to climb out of it. It's almost as if the system is designed to drive you to suicide. That's because it is designed to drive you to suicide. Remember depopulation? It's been in operation for decades. I think we can do better. I think that between us, we can make a society that people want to live in and have rich, fulfilling lives. So let's get to work. As a postscript, the government are planning a famine. Now this famine is designed to drive you into accepting their measures. The CBDCs, the 15 minute cities, the mandatory vaccines and the social credit system. So right now the farmers are being paid not to farm. They're also restricting food imports. And so the only food that will be available will be the GMO poison type. Farmland is being bought up like crazy by the privileged class. And the British public aren't seeing what's happening in France, Germany, the Netherlands, Romania and a few other countries. Where the farmers are rising up and they are blockading the government. They're forcing the government to, to listen to them. The same thing is, is about to happen here, but they need your support, so support the farmers. If I were leader now, I'd ask you to support the farmers, because they're fighting for us. 
In any case, don't be afraid of this engineered famine they're putting together. You already have everything you need to survive it, and not just survive it, but thrive in it. More on that later. But, you know, the message is, do not be afraid. Thanks for listening.